Ooh, little bit of background lighting going on here. Yes, oh, how does that look? Hello, welcome back to another book wrap up. Today I'm gonna wrap up the books that I read in August and I'm going to do the novels today and I'm gonna do a separate video for the mangas because it's a lot. Well, August is the best month for reading for me usually and that was the case with this past August as well. I read some uh, very great literary pieces and I will not do them any justice in describing them today or at any point in time. So let's just do it, let's talk about books. Let's just start with one fella that I completely fell in love with during this month and that is Haruki Murakami. I read two books by him. I read Norwegian Wood and I read uh, First Person Singular. By the way, excuse me, I've woken up on the wrong side of my brain, so to say. I slept on the left side. I feel like I lost a connection to my language center. <laughs> Not that I would be able to talk about Murakami uh, even if it was in German. Um, so I read Norwegian Wood, let's start with this. Um, and I read it over the course of three months, but that's not because it was so boring or I wasn't interested in it. Um, I read it during university times and this kind of is a bit demanding at times. And I had to be in a certain mind space to be able to read this. Um, but what I noticed throughout this whole entire three months is that I never lost my interest in it. I always wanted to come back to it. I never forgot about it. And once uh, I got back into the story, like 10, 10 pages in or something, I was totally living. Like this has some charm and magic to it. Or it's the translator, which seems to be always the same woman, Ursula Grefe. Perfect, like amazing translator. Uh, maybe she's the magic behind Murakami in the German language. Who knows but i'm reading all of his works translated because it's i i would have to anyway so i'm not gonna grab the english version i'm gonna stay with the german one that i understand best and it worked out anyhow let's talk about norwegian wood focus lena focus focus norwegian wood i would say let's give you a premise is a book about transitions the perspective that we read from is from Toru, uh, I think a 19 year old university student who has just recently graduated and who is in love with Naoko. Naoko being a former classmate of his um, and she's actually or she was the girlfriend of a common friend of theirs so they did a lot of things um, as a free in a threesome can you say that like they, they were friends, all of them, and then this friend, either while he was still in school or shortly after they graduated, he died. And it's a very tragic death at a very young age. And now Naoko has to deal with the aftermath and with the trauma that comes with losing her boyfriend at such a young age. Toru is meanwhile struggling with his love for Naoko because he fell in love with her, but he also struggles with transitions. Um, with going to university, with growing up, um, so it's sort of coming of age story about love and death and how like everything changes, dealing with loss. The subtitle of the German edition is a love story, which yeah, it definitely is a love story, but it's not a romance, it goes so much deeper than that. And the focus isn't only on the love. Now Murakami puts in a lot of very mundane scenes <laughs> in this book. And throughout reading it, I sometimes ask myself like, why is this in here? Why do we have to put those scenes in here? But somehow in the end it did make sense and it gave the whole thing a soul. Uh, I think that this was one of the strongest, the strongest endings that I have read in my entire life. I was literally speechless. I loved it a lot. I, it was so special to me. But I can guess that it would not be for everyone. <laughs> You know what? <laughs> my camera fell. And my audio, the battery, it jumped out of my microphone and I didn't notice. And I filmed a huge part of the video, the majority of the video, the rest of the video. <laughs> without noticing and I don't have audio in this, so I'm going to record the rest. I'm gonna re-record. I had some fire jokes in here. Um, I have a special ability that 
Not many people I feel have in fucking up footage. Miserable. <laughs> it's so miserable. <laughs> Please subscribe for me because fuel my misery. Let it not go to waste. Let it be worth something. I don't even know where I stopped to be honest. So I'm sorry for this harsh cut. I think it was right with the long walk. I hope I was done. It was definitely a page turner. And I feel like my my segue now is to say like, you know what was not a page turner? And then I would grab the it girl. I think it was like that. And my cat is playing and having fun underneath my camera stand. So I feel like the whole misery is gonna repeat itself. Um, the it girl by Ruth Wynn. <laughs> It was such a shitty book. Such a snore feast. Oh my god. Uh, I have filmed the video, but also the audio in that other video isn't great. There is a lot of wind noise and a lot of like um, noise from my neighbors because I filmed it on the balcony. Let me know if you still want to know, like have this video because it's a sort of third times a charm video inspired by Kayla from Books and Lala. I just wanted to, you know, see where Ruth Ware on the spectrum of of books lies with me like do I like her or do I not like her because up until I read the, the it girl I wasn't really sure I always liked her vibes uh, but somehow the story like the conclusions always felt uh, meh <laughs> not good um, and the it girl definitely you know put the nail in the coffin uh, because it, it was a teenage drama set in university. It's about um, a girl named Hannah, actually a woman because she's grown up and she's a woman. Um, and she kind of after 10 years after a murder having happened at the university that she went to, um, that she helped convicting the murderer to from, of. She kind of realizes there's new evidence surfacing. She isn't too sure after all whether the, the man that she helped imprisoning is actually the right person, the culprit. And obviously this could be a good book. There's a lot of room for reflection on it. There's a lot of, you know, guilt that the character could struggle with. But I feel like Ruth Ware misses literally every opportunity that she had um, to make this book into something great. So as I said, teenage coming of age drama with very flat characters. Also it features a thing that I don't like in my books, which is the time switching. It has like the whole um, what happened before and what happened after thing. I think it's often a very cheap uh, way to to build up suspense and I lose interest so the, the suspense kind of dies with that for me. But this book didn't have to use this mechanism because there was literally no suspense. It was a boring, boring book. And also the book uh, dragged. Fucking hell. I mean that's basically what I said <laughs> the entire time right now. Um, but I mean in a sense of there were scenes in there that were completely unnecessary so of no point there were basic there was one scene which i will also if i post a video mention in my video there's one scene that goes an entire page long of her ordering sparkling water and that has no purpose no purpose it has the purpose of showing that she's broke but Ruth Ware does that on literally seven other occasions so i didn't need this whole like um detour on her ordering a drink that she can't afford like even if it's sparkling water i don't know i don't i, I don't i didn't like this book no i didn't like this book okay let's move on what did i talk about next was it verity i don't know so let's talk about verity verity by colleen hoover this was the first book that i read by Colin Hoover. I made a video about it. If you are interested in more of my thoughts, being Colin Hoover, there's a lot of um, relationship drama and sexual sex, <laughs> sexual sex in this story. Not the sex was for me, but the sort of underlying theme. And if it was any other topic, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it that much. But what I can say, man, the narrator, because I listened to it in audiobook in the German version, unfortunately. But if you speak German, German narrator, there are two of them. But one of them who plays Loen, the main character, 
she's so good uh that's about it i don't want to talk more on it because you know you can always check out the other video next book is the woman in the purple skirt by natsuko imamura and i'm gonna read the premise to you for this one because it's very hard for me to wrap up the woman in the purple skirt is being watched someone is following her always perched just out of sight monitoring which buses she takes what she eats whom she speaks to but this invisible observer isn't a stalker it's much more complicated than that. We are actually the observer in the book. We are reading from the perspective of, of the observer. And it's, it, I don't know if I'm totally okay with this premise or this, this um, sum, summary on the back because I feel like something is missing. It's not so much an unwanted observer. There is something like uh, mysterious about the story and something where you like throughout reading it you ask yourself like what is happening like what is this where are we but it's not thriller vibes it's not oh my god the observer what's he gonna do to her no 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 it's just a story of a woman in a purple skirt living her life and just being observed but it's a quick story a quick read and if you just look for something that's a bit out of the box a bit like yeah mystery a bit a confusion a short confusion then maybe this this is a good pick I can't believe that I have to talk about this again. <sighs> this was so hard to wrap up the first time. Maybe I'm gonna be better at it the second time. It's House of Leaves. I read House of Leaves, yeah. <laughs> Where's my excitement gone? I read fucking House of Leaves, y'all. Finally, I have an excuse to not hold up the books the entire time because this is a heavy hitter. Not only the size of this and the weight of it, but also uh, the compounds of it, like the what is inside. The way that I felt after I had read it, I felt physically ill, in a sense of dizzy. I felt dizzy. I felt like I had just taken one too many roller coasters. I've never felt that way. It is... It's an infamous book, so I don't know, maybe you've heard of it. If you're a horror fan, you definitely have, because it's one of the books that gets recommended to you non-stop if you're looking for haunted house stories, which I have during this summer. I have actually bought that when I was 16, sorry, almost uh, knocked the book off the shelf. When I was 16, started to read it, sort of lost interest in it because it's not that easy to read then picked it up like 10 years later was like i'm gonna finish this bitch now uh so let me try and explain this book this is gonna go badly i can already sense it so we have basically two stories in this we have johnny johnny who finds a script by a guy named zampano 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 who died recently and this guy has written a sort of academic analysis of a documentary that a guy named Nevison has, has filmed. And this documentary is about the family, the Nevisons, moving into a house that is sort of not a normal house. So there's like a corridor appearing out of nowhere pitch black and nobody knows where it leads to. But then you have also Johnny who finds this record, who puts it all together, commenting in the footnotes and kind of bringing his own private life into the footnotes and telling you about how the story has affected his own life and how, he, like you see him losing his mind. So um, this was an experience, let's say. It was definitely an experience. It is also rather a book to experience than a story to read. I hate that I can only use experience for to describe this. I definitely felt like I was in a labyrinth. Um, there were parts and I know that many people have started it and DNF this book, I can completely understand. I did that once myself. So um, there are parts in this that drag, like the, the you are not interested in the, the analysis parts. I would advise you to do it slowly. Don't be stupid like I was. Um, I wanted to finish it on vacation, while I was still on vacation, so I rushed through it um, and I finished it in like a week or something 
And I uh, don't, don't, don't. It fucks with your reading. It totally fucks with you. I felt exhausted. I was moving forward so slowly. It, it drained me. No, take your sweet time. Read whenever you feel like reading. This book is a book that will wait for you. Yes. And I've also seen, I did the stupid approach. I read all at once. So I read the main story and then I read the footnotes at the same time. And I've seen some people reading the main story first and then the footnotes after it, which is definitely a smaller way to approach it. So you can, you can read it in multiple ways. What I enjoyed a lot is uh, the way that it is built. So it is like visually doing stuff for you. So like, for example, when they're talking about the Minotaurs and they're talking about labyrinths, it's actually visually resembling that within the book. And also one part which I discovered, which I think is not a spoiler, so I'm gonna mention it because I thought it was brilliant. This one part, I will not find the exact uh, page, but I'm gonna just, because it was somewhere around here. There's one part where a character climbs a ladder and you have to read from the side. So you have to read it like this, and in order to read it, you have to hold on. That's what I did. You have to hold on to the book. So I did it like this. Hold on to the book, read. And I felt the fucking weight of the book. So it felt like hanging on to a letter for me. This is brilliant. Oh my God, the execution, the construction of this, amazing. There were also part that I didn't enjoy that much. Let's say for the most part, that it was very American. This is not meant to be an insult. It's just there's all this gun action and I'm not a fan of that. And I heard many people say that this was the best part for them. I, I can't, I can't uh, confirm, no. I think that was actually the worst part. Everything else was brilliant. <laughs> no, not everything else. But you know, it's definitely an experience. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Then I would love to talk about two books that I have read from the live. Don't make those noises if I'm talking about horror books, please. Now I'm afraid, you know? Why? And he always does that when I'm talking about House of Leaves. You, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's freaking me out. I shouldn't talk about this, I feel like. Say hi to the camera. Say hi. Say hi. Hi. Yes. No, don't make it fall down again. Bad idea. I have great ideas. This is why I have such a successful channel that doesn't use subscribers every time I post a video with lots of regular content. <laughs> because I do smart decisions like that. Okay, let's talk about My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendrix. I borrowed this from the library and only after the fact I realized that this was by Grady Hendrix, of which uh, the Sovereign Book Cup's Guide for Slaying Vampires, something like that, is from, and I hated that book. That was, oh my god, I hated it. That was like one of the most misogynistic writings also boring, by the way. Every horror element in the book kind of surround was surrounding womanhood or something. So like, I mean, not everything. There were insects in there too and something like that. Body horror, I mean. But the body horror <laughs> was, was completely dependent on like a woman's self-image of her body and her her not feeling confident in it. Conilingus, for example, was used as, an horror, as a horror element. And I'm, no, I don't agree. <laughs> I don't think that is a horrifying scene to orally please a woman, no. <laughs> also, like a little bit more fat on the hips. Don't think it's a horrible sight. Why make it an issue? Like, why, why put it in there as something that should disgust us? Don't know. So that's my background with him. Um, I interpreted his uh, sense of horror to be sexist. Uh, so I was very skeptical about this, but I also like am new to the library game and I don't want to bring books back to the library that I haven't finished. So I wanted to give this a chance. Maybe it would surprise me and fucking hell it did. 
I would never ever thought. Talking about star ratings here. I gave the vampire book shit one out of ten stars because I thought it was. And the my best friend's exorcism ten out of ten. So how how great can a difference be? How? 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 I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I saw a lot of reoccurring themes. I um, noticed that he likes to um, kind of cut the ropes of hope for the main character so that they go through a very uncomfortable and miserable time of loneliness. I like that actually. I appreciate feeling uncomfortable in my horror books. There were also comedic elements within that that I thought fit because the characters were young, they were teenagers. It didn't take itself too seriously. Also, I forgot to tell you what this book is about. It is definitely, name of the book describes it the best way. It's about two friends, two best friends of whom one from one day to another uh, just uh, changes and they act very strangely and they also change their looks and stuff like that and they become mean. We have a certain idea of what has happened to the character, you know, related to the title of the book. I mean, it could be puberty, <laughs> but it could also be possessed by a demon. Both very similar. Honestly, I just liked um, the way that this was built on friendship. I like friendship stories and it was also, it wasn't too horrifying. So if you like a scary cat, I feel like, it, especially with the comedic relief, it is definitely a book you can check out if you're just a beginner or just curious about horror books. And it's wholesome in its way. The next book that I have read and have already brought back to the library because does it surprise you that I'm not good at planning which books I would maybe need for a wrap up. It's The Silent Companions by Laura Purcell. When Elsie married handsome young hair Rupert Bainbridge, she believed she was just destined for a life of luxury. But pregnant and widowed just weeks after the wedding, with her new servants resentful and the local villagers actively hostile, Elsie has only her late husband's awkward cousin for company. Well, the first thing that maybe strikes your attention as it did mine, uh, yeah, pregnant woman. Especially when it's in horror, it's something that makes me a bit nervous. There are some things that happen that are stressful to read if you have your own trauma with relating to pregnancy. It's just, there is not that much description. This is like a, a gothic uh, Victorian ghost tale. The horror definitely picks up in the end. The beginning was quite slow and just like a slow and spooky little build up. And then in the end, you know, they... <sighs> solid, a solid book. And now let's talk about the final book that I read for the month of August, which was in the manga. And that is uh, Shameful Life by Osama Dazai. And don't be stupid like I did. Uh, this is, by the way, actually the same story as No Longer Human. And guess what? I have this book at home. I have two copies of the same book, <laughs> uh, but in different versions, because this is a new translation. This is the old translation. This is from 2018. I forgot from when this is. 1958. You know, I flicked through No Longer Human just to have a glance uh, and compare like the two translations to each other and I would definitely say that A Shameful Life I think is more approachable. It's definitely more accessible if you want to read uh, the Sai and you, you don't know how bulky the translation will be because I read the translator's note and he said he just wanted to make Westerners be able to enjoy this book without having to know so much about um, the Japanese way of thinking and history. So he tried to convey uh, the feeling and the message more than he actually gave a correct and word by word translation. Desai has taken inspiration from uh, aspects and events that he himself has lived through but it is not really autobiographical we still have to differentiate between um Dazai, which is by the way also a pen name it wasn't his actual name and the character in the book so although the lives kind of have some 
over crossing it's definitely not the same it's still it's still separated the afterword by the way also says that this is full of references and innuendos which obviously i couldn't detect because i'm a newbie in this what i can say is that i feel like this book is also recommendable if you don't know that much about japanese culture if you just purely come from a western perspective but you are curious and you would like to approach a japanese classic this is a very approachable you can read this it's like um only a hundred and 20 pages or something and then there's an afterword if you're curious if you want to read a classic you want to challenge yourself but not too much i think that is a great way to start so i'm at the end of the video oh my god <laughs> wow i hope that the transition wasn't too harsh from when my camera fell to where i picked it up again um but i thank you so much for watching right now it's like Thank you for bearing with me through this, this drama and struggle. Um, and I hope I'll see you at another time in another video. Bye.